if you're in New York City, you're going to pay 40K a year to have your kid do macaroni paintings when they're three. Easy. Like, no joke. That's probably a bargain rate. <laughs> yeah. Seriously. Which is insane. Hey everyone, I'm Meredith Chirey. I'm a licensed psychotherapist specializing in relationship issues. And I'm Isaiah Vallejo Justy, a divorce attorney. This is a podcast about filling in the gaps of our relationships, the deeply personal choices we make for our families and ourselves, and the impact our actions have on the rest of our lives. This is Love Me or Leave Me. Hey, welcome back, everyone. You know, in our last episode, we spoke about a lot of the kind of nuanced things that you should talk about before you get married. And, you know, I know for myself in particular, I learned quite a bit from that because there are some things I even think about um, that you can talk about before you get married or before you commit. But, you know, now there are two things that we left out. We did that on purpose. Two of the most complex issues that you can speak about before you really commit or get married. And we did that on purpose because it's so complex, right? Those two things are children and money. I can't tell you the number of times people come into my office with extreme conflicts in in those areas. And especially when it comes to money, I think that one of the things people have a problem with is not necessarily the amount. It's not this dollar amount in our bank account. It's usually the much more complex and more ethereal issues of what are our values that are attached to money. So for some people, it's like, if I'm a spender and you're a saver, for me, having money might mean, you know, freedom or flexibility, where you might think it means security. And so it can be really, really complicated in that way. And especially with gender differences, And then of course with children, it's equally complex in a very different way. But I think for us, we have these interesting careers where they're complex in both of our offices, but for very different reasons. In particular, when it comes to children, common source of conflict would be whether or not to have them. Sometimes I see couples who maybe didn't have a discussion about whether or not they wanted to have children and what happens if they find out after they get married that they disagree. Right. Or I've seen it where what happens if a a lie was told and somebody says they want to have children and they didn't. Well, I think you can probably attest to this better than I could, but for the love of God, if you're going to lie to someone, you know, it's all going to come out when you get married. So no one benefits by being dishonest about that. And I think that that is so true though, even if it's not someone being dishonest, but don't be idealistic where it's like, well, maybe in some sphere of life, I would want the five children that you want. But if you know you don't want that, you're going to have to be honest before you get married, because otherwise you're setting yourself up for so much heartbreak once you get married. And to your point, I think that one of the other points is don't think you're going to change your partner's mind thinking, oh, well, they don't want children now, but once we get married, they'll want them. No, you need to take them at their word as it stands now. It certainly does happen. Right. You certainly do see people who, before they get married, they say, you know, they don't want to have kids and then they get older. There are times when um, people, men and women, not just women, will say, you know, I want to have a child, even though I said I didn't want to have a child. And then that can cause conflict. But at least in that case, if you've spoken about beforehand, you at least had that good faith and kind of discussion so that, you know, you can't say, wow, this is something we should really should have discussed. Right. Like, like you've discussed it. So things happen and that happens and that's okay. But yeah, having these discussions regarding children are tremendously important. How to have those discussions, I think, are just as important. Adding context to the why is so important. This is important to me because, because even if you disagree, like you were saying, and and listen, we're humans, we're, we're going to change and it's okay to change your mind. But I think when you have the context to why you're changing your mind or why you feel a certain way that you do, and you understand that from your spouse, right? And you're coming at this from a place of you're both wanting to lean in and understand that. Then what happens most of the time is most people are are so invested in preserving the relationship that they might actually be willing to budge on that. That I think is what's more important here is, is being willing to be vulnerable and to be honest with yourself and with your partner. Well, you can be one thing with your partner. You have to be honest. Another thing that you have to take into account is that, you know, we can certainly make all the plans that we want. Those plans don't always come to fruition. You know, sometimes people struggle to have children. You know, sometimes they have miscarriages. Sometimes, you know, you find out that somebody can't have a child, be it the husband or the wife or or a partner or spouse. And what do you do in that situation? So it might be instructive to have that type of conversation before you get married. Now, I'll say that you never know what it's like 
not to be able to have children until you're in that situation. For example, there has been a series of miscarriages or you find out that you need to do IVF or the husband cannot have a child, low sperm count, things of that nature. Those are things you can't sometimes prepare for. And you don't know how you're gonna to react to it until you're in that situation. But by having these conversations kind of beforehand, you would have at least laid the groundwork that it's okay to have those types of conversations. And then you can build upon that foundation and then use that to have these new conversations that you now need to have. It's about, like you said, laying the groundwork and having an idea of each person's values and their backgrounds and what's important. Because you're right. I think more and more the conversations about infertility are becoming a little more socially acceptable, which is wonderful because it's certainly not talked about enough. And this is actually something I've seen quite a bit in couples work is that what happens a lot of times is we have this romantic view, right? Okay, we had the conversation around children. We both want to have them. Wonderful. Great. Let's do this. We get married and then we start trying to have a child, right? And then we start facing disappointment because it's not happening. And then we find out, you know, there's maybe there's some fertility issues. And if we haven't had the conversations about, okay, what is our plan B? We need to have some contingency plans. Is someone open to adoption, right? So if one person's fertile, but another person's not, do we want to consider having either an egg or a sperm donor or a surrogate? And not only just the ethics of that, because for some people, there's some real serious moral and ethical obligations. For some people, they think that IVF or going that route might be a little too much like playing God. And for other people, people, they might really want to have a biological child through any means, be it I, IVF or whatever, but they really don't want to have adoption as an option. So if one of you says, I want a child no matter what, whether it's my child or not, and the other one says, I only want to have a child if it's biological, that is something that you really need to know because it's going to impact how you see the future of the relationship. And to your point, nothing prepares you for those unknowns. And trauma has a huge impact on us. We never know entirely how we're going to deal with something like grief. It is very possible that you went into this marriage happy and connected and through a series of miscarriages, and again, through no one's fault, it's very possible that that could deteriorate the connection in the marriage and lead you to people maybe falling out of love. And again, that's not either person's fault. It's just a product of layers of trauma. That's true. And you know, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to lead to the deterioration of the marriage. If the couple has come together and, and have that layer of communication, that foundation to build upon, it could just be something else, another conversation, other things to have dealt with. I think a lot of what we're talking about in this episode and the previous episodes, and probably those to come as well, is laying the foundation for communication. We had two communication episodes, but really it could be a communication podcast because marriage <laughs> is so much about communication and open communication and continuously talking and hey, you know what? Sometimes you're gonna disagree. Truth is that some disagreements are gonna be insurmountable, but a lot aren't, and it's gonna depend upon the marriage, but you'll have a better chance at there not being an insurmountable disagreement if you've had these conversations beforehand. So certainly we're not saying, you know, plan out your entire life, but don't be deaf either. Don't be deaf either. Don't go into this completely blind and oh, let's just figure it out, what we're going to do and how we're going. Now, another thing that I think when it comes to children that you should speak about is parenting styles and what kind of parent you foresee yourself being and how involved you think you're going to be and you foresee parental relationships looking like. Oh, absolutely. And that includes relationships with family, schooling. There are so many things we could talk about. And I think we are going to have some future episodes on children so we can dive a lot more into parenting styles, those kinds of things. To your point, that's entirely right. Now, I see this happening around discipline and values quite a bit. So you know, if a kid brings home what is a quote unquote bad grade, well, how do you determine what's a good grade versus a bad grade? And how do you decide if there's punishment, if there's some kind of, you know, redirection, or if we just give praise, those things get so complicated so quickly. And even around schooling and academics, do we value academics over sports or over extracurriculars? Do we want our child to go to private school versus public school? Who's going to pay for that? Because if you're in New York City, you're going to pay 40K a year to have your kid do macaroni paintings when they're three. Easy. Like, no joke. That's probably a bargain, a bargain rate. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. Which is insane, you know. Seriously. Um, and I think a good predictor of that, of the education stuff, is to find out what the experience of your actual partner was, right? If your partner went to, to private school, well, guess what? He or she doesn't want the kids to go to private school, probably. Exactly. If your partner went to public school, 
you know, he or she's going to want the kids maybe to go to public school. And a lot of times that transcends money. So, you know, just looking at each other's experiences will probably foretell what this will look like in the future. If your partner was obsessed about their grades and still talk about the C plus they got in economics at NYU, talking about myself. (laughs) Yeah, maybe they'll be a little strict when it comes to the grades. But those are all things to kind of consider when it comes to these things, you know, and then there's, you know, there's the other thing of children from previous relationships as well. That's a mm. big one that I see because it takes the partner that's not the parent who's going to be the step parent to be a really big person. Because what right. happens then is there's three people in a relationship and not two. You know, I know that you're a child of divorce. I am too. And I was at an interesting age. So my parents got divorced when I was 16. One of my parents got remarried when I was about 17 and the other one when I had just turned 18. It was an interesting thing in seeing their different versions of incorporating step parents, being a blended family. And I've actually seen this quite a bit too in some of the families that I see. Blended families, that is a complicated pattern to weave. The the step parent coming in they have to have the patience of a saint because they're probably going to be taking a lot of hits from the child and a lot of boundary testing. And so they're trying to figure out their romantic relationship with a romantic partner. And they're also going to have to have a ton of flexibility with this child because the thing is, that's not their child. And the child and the other parent will remind them of that in a second. But the other part of it that's also very, very hard is that For the biological parent, they cannot force a relationship with a step-parent. That needs to happen organically. And the child really ends up being the one who has a lot of control in that. Not in terms of discipline. Now, if your child's acting out and trying to set fire to the new parent's clothes, like, okay, you need to address that. You know, we're not talking about safety issues, but we're talking more about the relational connection. You cannot force the child to have a relationship there. And the best thing that the the step-parent can do is to just invite it rather than demand the relationship. And there's also legal considerations as well. You know, for example, you know, their child support payments going out, right? That's money that's going to be going out on a monthly basis. What's the uh, custody schedule like? So maybe the other parent has 50% of the time or every other weekend or a couple times a week. You know, those are times that are going to be set in stone. As a step parent, probably should encourage that. You need to encourage those things and encourage the relationships. You know, that makes a big difference to the child. And it makes the relationship easier with the spouse as well. So I think our takeaway here is that blended families are very complicated. Can we agree on that? They're beautiful things and they're also very complicated. You know, I'm curious then how prenuptial agreements factor into all of this because we're talking about trying to make sure that we are being protective. And that seems like a fairly obvious or very, very direct way to try to protect yourself. Well, when it comes to children, at least in New York, can't really provide for that in a prenup. It's against public policy to touch upon things like child support in a prenup. But prenups are generally used with respect to marital assets or rather really not marital assets, but assets that you have before the marriage or that you may be receiving during the marriage that you want to protect. You know, some of the most popular things are businesses, real estate investments, other type of investments or inheritance. So what you want to do in your prenup is that it gives you a certain amount of, of certainty as to what's going to happen with those assets. Another thing that you can touch upon is maintenance or alimony. You can have waivers in the in a prenup. You can have it that there's a certain amount of maintenance paid depending upon the length of the marriage. You can waive inheritance rights as well in prenups. So they're very important tools. At least I've seen this happen a few times where I've had couples who actually ended up in my office because they were trying to get a prenuptial agreement. And it became really, really contentious because from what I understand, it's almost like they set it up like a divorce. You're sitting on opposite sides of the table. You each have your own lawyer. And I think that for a lot of couples that that becomes so contrary to what they think they're doing. So we're supposed to be looking forward to our future and getting married and joining. And yet it's as though we're already breaking up and it can put such a sour taste in people's mouths. Do you think that they're helpful or do you think they just set people up for conflict? They're definitely helpful. Any conversation that you have can set you up for conflict. So prenups can absolutely set you up for conflict. It depends upon how you're going to get this prenup done. And really it depends upon what you both want. If what the couple wants are two completely divergent things, 
then it's not the prenup's fault that there's a conflict. It's the couple who have different things that they want to accomplish in the prenup. If the couple is on the same page as for what they want in the prenup, that's another situation. There's no reason why prenups have to be high conflict unless there's real disagreement between the parties. And even then, there's usually ways to resolve these things. You guys do love each other, so, and you're going to get married, and you want to get married. So you should find a way, if we want to get married, to resolve these issues. And sometimes there's almost an existential issue with respect to the prenup, because one party wants it and the other party doesn't. Mm. And that's probably more difficult. I would say that usually that's not the case of what you see. Usually the case of what you see in a high conflict thing is more something along the lines of the people don't see eye to eye on the terms they want in the prenup. So that requires you to be really open and honest with your communications with your fiance and be open and honest with your communications with the attorneys. And then having attorneys meet together in a meeting with both parties can also result in good settlements. As a couples therapist, I actually love the idea of prenups because in my view, it's not about preparing for the end, but it's almost the analogy I like to think about is almost thinking about like short or long-term disability. You sign up for it with the hope that you don't have to use it, but if you have it, wonderful. It's probably saved you a lot of stress and headache because the thing is when you're getting married, you're thinking about the positive things about a relationship and hopefully you're in a place where you're connected and you're happy. You're also probably going to be willing to give each other the benefit of the doubt versus when you're on the other side of it. And we'd even talked about this, that this is one of the main points of contention in a divorce where people get really, really Really angry and become very, very rigid and get really upset. So when you're upset and when you're in that emotional space, you're not going to give each other the benefit of the doubt. You're not going to be making decisions with overall well-being in mind. You're just going to be thinking about this is what I want to hear now, or I'm angry and this is how I want to hurt this person. So my thought with prenups from doing couple therapy is that this is going to allow you to make some future decisions while you still are actually going to be nice and like each other versus when you're going to be angry and potentially vindictive. It's really part of a larger conversation and really with respect to finances overall. Um, there's so much conflict that can happen within finance and how you spend your money and what money are you earning and what are you going to do? There's kind of two or three models out there. There's like one model where everything is combined, another model where everything is separate, and then like kind of one that's kind of in between. And, that, and maybe you want to have that discussion as well as part of this all overall conversation. As to how you're going to run your, your household, how you're going to run your your finances. Maybe that's even something you start doing before you get married so you can get a flavor for it. Maybe have conversations about what type of assets you have, what types of debts you have. Right now, you know, student loans can be very high. So that's mm. so that maybe you want to have a discussion around th those types of things as well. I think it's so much deeper than, again, just this arbitrary number in your bank account. It's about your values and it's about the future you see. If you want to buy property with this person and they have a credit score of, you know, 500, that's something you're going to need to know about. Now, that's not saying first date you go in and saying, hey, can you give me um, a summary of your assets, your, your credit score, and maybe your mom's maiden name and your social? You know, you're not going to do that. But you do need to, at least at some point in dating and that kind of thing, start getting an idea of if this person is at a maybe lower paying job that has 200000 in student debt, that's something you want to know about. It might not change your decision to commit to them, but it might have an impact on how you want to divide assets and what you want to do in your marriage. Where where you want to live, how much you want to allocate towards travel, or if you want to have children, retire, all those other things. And I think that those are the things that people probably don't want to think about because it's not a sexy conversation to say, hey, what's your credit score? But at the same time, and I'm sure you could speak to this, horror stories of people not realizing that after you get married, things like debt are shared. If one person accrues debt, the other person could potentially be liable for it. And so you need to know if your partner is someone who is maybe a reckless spender. Debt that's occurred during the marriage could be marital debt. Absolutely. So if somebody's more inclined to incur than the other person, that can be a problem. You know, on this, on the other side of things, assets that are accrued during the marriage are generally considered marital property as well. And those are usually split. So if you have one person that's incurring all the debt and the other person that's incurring all the assets, then if there's a divorce, then the person who's incurring all the assets may be upset about the result of that. Yeah. But really, you're talking about living together and just experiencing life together. So not having these conversations are going to have impacts or can have impacts the minute you get married, like not even if you get a divorce. If you're in, during a marriage, you want to get an apartment, 
in a city and you need 40 times rent, well, you should figure out whether you can live where you want to live or shop where you want to shop right. or, or eat where you want to eat or live the lifestyle that you think you want to live. Now, as long as those two things are kind of together and in, in, in alignment, then it's fine. Maybe you guys want to build together if you don't have a lot. Or maybe you guys are, one spouse says, hey, I recognize that you don't have as much as me and that's okay. I'm more than willing to like support you. That's great. And that's a beautiful thing. But not knowing that and then realizing, wait a minute, I can't afford to move in the apartment that I wanted to move into or I can't live the life that I that I thought I wanted to live is not a good realization after you got married. I think that that's when people incur the most resentment and build those scars that are a lot harder to get over because at that point you feel in some ways like you've been misled, betrayed even, you could use that word, right? And so that's why I think one of the big take homes that we're saying in this is that you really need to be honest and forthcoming. Hiding things is only going to hurt both of you in the long term. And you're right. I think it's about to being honest about like what your lifestyle is. If you're dating and you know that this person likes to be a lavish spender, but you are someone who feels very uncomfortable with that, you need to talk about if you expect that to change once you get married, because if they want to get 17 cups of Starbucks a day and that gives you anxiety and is making your blood pressure go up, Again, you need to have a plan for that and some form of a compromise and knowing how you want to address those things. Because again, it's not about this, this arbitrary number. It's about your values attached to it. For me personally, I know that money is a lot of times tied to autonomy. So I would not want a partner who's going to tell me I can't buy this Louis Vuitton purse that I want. Whereas someone else might be like, that is a silly thing to spend money on. Or like you've, you've traveled twice this year. Why do you need to go out of the country again? And I wouldn't want to be told what to do with that because again, for me, the value is the autonomy, whereas the other person might see it as scary and that I'm being reckless and hurting them if their value is security. And again, I'm not like a reckless spender here. The point is you're, you can see how quickly this can create a conflict because each person could interpret this as you were hurting me, right? Or you were taking something from me. And that's why money gets so, so heated so quickly. And it's really just about being honest with yourself and with your partner and finding ways to be flexible. Again, you know, if we say it once, we'll say it a thousand times. We're trying to figure out how to move from I to we. Well, if you think that, let's say, like the average person gets married at like 32 and the average person dies at, let's say, like 85. So that's like 53 years. And everybody who's getting married says, hey, you know, I want to be married to this person for the rest of my life. That's the that's the commitment I'm making. Well, you're, then you're trying to make a 53 year commitment. There's not much you can hide over the course of 53 years. So <laughs> at some point it's coming out. So it might as well come out beforehand so that you can have the long marriage that you, that you want. I love that. If you want to have a long marriage, talk about this stuff beforehand, because otherwise that's going to be a long, miserable 53 years. Well, Isaiah, we have given people so much to chew on, so maybe we should give them some time to digest. See what I did there? I see what you did. So we're so excited. Our next episode, we're going to do something a little bit different, and we're actually going to have our very first guest. Ooh. This is one of Isaiah's friends. We're so excited. This is a nutritionist named Susan Greeley, and we are going to be so excited to talk to her about what it's like to do some self-care, talk about nutrition, and how to keep it sexy and fun in 2021. Love Me or Leave Me is a podcast production of The Board Brand. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It does not constitute medical or legal advice and is not a substitute for professional consultation, diagnoses, or treatment. Always follow up with a licensed attorney or healthcare professional who can address your specific needs. Thanks for listening.